Let's talk about parasites. Parasites are shocking. Some of them are large enough to be seen without magnification as they crawl across the surface of the eyeball, wiggle under the skin, or exit from various orifices of the body. But parasites are fascinating and diverse creatures which live in association with a host, such as a human, and cause that host some harm. Many parasites have complicated life cycles that involve multiple hosts and different developmental stages of the parasite within the host. Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm your host, JCM Editor-in-Chief, Alex McAdam. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. I'm joined by two expert guests to discuss parasites. Dr. Bobby Pritt is Director of the Clinical Parasitology Laboratory and Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at the Mayo Clinic. She's also an editor of JCM. Bobby, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Mark Couturier is the Medical Director of Parasitology, Fecal Testing, Infectious Disease Antigen Testing, and Bacteriology at ARUP Laboratories and an Associate Professor at the University of Utah School of Medicine. He's also a member of the Editorial Board of JCM. Mark, I'm glad you could join us. Thanks, Alex. I'm excited for this. It should be great. Bobby, I want to start with you, please. Um, can you improve on that uh, definition of parasites that I gave a few minutes ago? I mentioned that they live with the host and they harm the host. What would you add to improve that definition? Sure. Um, well, I think it's great to start with a definition because people use the word parasite to mean a lot of different things. Um, in politics and across our uh, lingo. So in medicine, a parasite is defined as an organism that lives in or on a genetically unrelated organism. So it has to be a different organism, different genus, different species. Um, and that organism is called a host and it takes either food or shelter from the host, but doesn't give any benefit in return. So I'll narrow that a little bit more. You know, this could apply to a lot of different things, bacteria, viruses. Sometimes people use it in that manner, but the strict definition only applies to eukaryotic organisms and it excludes fungi. So that's basically the worms, the bugs, the ectoparasites, and the protozoa. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. And can you give us an idea of how much harm parasites cause in terms of, of global health? Absolutely. So it's a tremendous amount of harm that is caused each year. Malaria alone affects an estimated 228 million people worldwide each year. It's responsible for more than 400,000 deaths annually. But then we have 12 other categories of parasites that the World Health Organization classifies as neglect, um, neglected tropical diseases because they disproportionately affect individuals living in tropics, um, the subtropics, where people live in poverty without adequate sanitation. And so the WHO says that these in, um, diseases affect more than 1 million people which is about one out of every seven or eight people worldwide. So that's just an amazing figure right there. And it costs our developing economies billions of dollars each year. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when I, I tell this, the medical students this, we, when we teach parasitology um, here, and uh, we talk about the cost in terms of global health, and, and we say mm -hmm. that malaria causes uh, as many deaths as you mentioned, and that most of them are un children under five years of age in sub-Saharan Africa. Is that still correct? Right. It is still correct, and it's just devastating for the families involved as you can imagine. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bobby, I wanna to turn to your blog, uh, Creepy, Dreadful, Wonderful Parasites. That's a blog that you've had for over 10 years. Yeah. Um, and you had a really interesting discussion about the blog with Dr. Julie Wolf on another ASM podcast, Meet the Microbiologist. Um, people should check out both the blog and that podcast, which they can find online. We're not gonna talk a lot about the history of the blog because you and Julie covered it so nicely. Um, but I'd like to use the title of your blog to get some understanding of the diversity of parasites. So let's talk about a parasite that's creepy, a parasite that's dreadful, and a parasite that's wonderful. So we'll start with <laughs> creepy. Okay. What parasite is particularly creepy? All right, so I love this approach, Alex. This is great. Um, I should start by acknowledging that most people would consider all parasites to be <laughs> creepy. Uh, so this is probably one of the easiest categories, but I should mention that I don't usually get creeped out by parasites. So for me, it's a little harder to pick one. 
But having said that, I think that bot flies that cause myiasis would be up there as far as parasites I would consider to be creepy. Um, and we know that bot flies can live in the skin. They can even crawl under the skin and they can live in wounds and in necrotic tissue. And some of the really disturbing cases of wound myiasis I've seen have been particularly creepy, like the ones involving the mouth and the ear. And I've even spent an evening with a summer student I had of mine uh, pulling maggots out of a sheep, which was quite the experience for him. But, you know, I wanted to give him a unique experience for his time with me. Uh, so, yeah, that would be my top pick for creepy. Your, your student won't forget that. And you mentioned that <laughs> you don't find all of them creepy. We had a bot fly here a few years back and I was very excited about it. And we looked at it under the dissecting scope and reported mm -hmm. it and stuff. And then I had it in a little dish and I carried it down and showed it to a colleague and I was all fired up about it. And I said, here's the patient's story and here's what happened. And it came out of the skin and all this stuff. And, and my colleague sat patiently and listened to the whole thing and then said quietly, could you please get that out of my office? <laughs> Yeah, most people don't have the same, you know, excitement we may about no. uh, things like maggots, right? <laughs> um, all right, Bobby, next we've got dreadful. What's an mm -hmm. example of a dreadful parasite? Yeah, I think a truly dreadful parasite is one we've mentioned briefly, Plasmodium falciparum, the most mm -hmm. serious cause of malaria in the world. Um, as we already said, it kills a tremendous number of people each year, especially hard hitting the, uh, the children under the age of five. And, you know, this actually used to be in the millions each year. It's only been the recent worldwide efforts to eliminate and maybe someday eradicate malaria that's gotten the number of deaths down. And it's such a serious pathogen that, as we know, many different human mutations have arisen independently in many different populations over the centuries um, in people who are regularly exposed to infection to offer some sort of protective benefit. So that just shows how serious of a disease this is, that we have things like sickle cell anemia, which in its homozygous state can be a life-threatening disease in and of itself, but yet it's worthwhile genetically or evolutionarily um, it provided enough of a benefit that it stuck around because it protected people from malaria. So truly dreadful disease. Mm, it is truly dreadful. And you, you mentioned the very welcome reduction in the number of cases and deaths associated with Plasmodium falciparum. Mm -hmm. What are your, what's your quick take on the prospects for eradication of the? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Well, I think elimination is definitely possible because we've seen that. That's when you get rid of the parasite and natural transmission in a specific area. Like people may f not realize that we used to have malaria in the United States, but we've eliminated malaria from the US. At least it's not naturally occurring. But to totally eradicate, wipe off the face of the earth, essentially, uh, a parasite that has a complex life cycle, I think it's gonna be really challenging. I think the only way we'd be able to do it is if we had a really good vaccine and maybe did some genetic modifications of mosquitoes as well. That's so a high bar. It's a high bar. Well, let's hope, we, let's hope it's we worth, it. It's worth aiming for. I just, uh, yeah, it's a high bar. Yeah, yeah. All right, and next, I think we have wonderful. So this is yes. a tough one. What what parasite <laughs> is what parasite is wonderful? Well, wouldn't you say all parasites are wonderful as in, well as creepy their, and dreadful? <laughs> in their way. Which one would so, you like to pick out? Yeah. So. Uh, I agree this is a bit challenging because not many people would agree with me that parasites can be wonderful. They, as we mentioned, cause a lot of morbidity and mortality. But I use this term in the context of its older meaning of inspiring wonder or being amazing. And I think you could argue that certain parasites really truly are amazing and wonder inspiring with their complex life cycles and ingenious ways of ev uh, evading the host's immune response, their beautiful morphology, diverse ways of moving. Um, so one parasite I find particularly wonderful is Toxoplasma gondii. It's a apicomplexin parasite. It can infect any nucleated cell. It can infect a diverse range of hosts, including humans and other mammals and even birds. So I talk about that at Thanksgiving when we talk about our Thanksgiving 
Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> um, <laughs> it subverts the uh, host's cell-mediated immune response to essentially persist for the life of the host. And a feature I think is really fascinating is that it alters the neurochemistry of the host. And some recent studies have shown that that might actually be a permanent alteration of the neurochemistry. And there have been a number of studies, old and new, on infected and uninfected mice. And it's shown that infected mice lose their innate fear of cat odors, like cat urine, which presumably increases their likelihood of being eaten. And it just so happens that cats are the only definitive host for this parasite. So this is an example where the parasite is manipulating its host to ensure its own survival, which is creepy, dreadful, but also kind of wonderful in a interesting way. <laughs> it is. It is wonderful. And and you mentioned you mentioned that the morphology of some of the parasites, the appearance of some oh, of the parasites yeah. can be particularly yeah. wonderful. And that reminded me of this. For people who are listening and can't see, I'm holding up my phone, which has a case oh. that shows chromosomes <laughs> on it. And this is a case that uh, has a photograph that Bobby made, in fact. Uh, so that's fun. Um, thank you, Bobby. I'm going to turn to Mark for just a few minutes, and then we will come back to the both of you. Um, Mark, you had a paper titled Detection of Intestinal Protozoa in Trichrome Stained Stool Specimens by Use of a Deep Convolutional Neural Network, and that was published in JCM back in June. Uh, I thought the paper was absolutely fascinating. It really blew my mind. There are very few papers about uh, in clinical microbiology about using image analysis and artificial intelligence to detect pathogens um, from images of microscope slides. But yours is, I think, unique in that it actually described a system that was fully ready to go. It was ready for implementation in the clinical laboratory. So before we get into what you did, can you set the stage for us a little bit by telling us what problem you were trying to solve? Sure. Um, you know, really, I think every, every large peristology lab has the same problem. The volumes for OVA and parasite testing are really high. Not a lot of labs want to do them, so they often become the first test that gets put to send out. And often they can justify long turnaround times because most of the results are not, you know, critically life-threatening. In fact, very few are. And so for our lab, our volumes in the 10 years I've been directing have just gotten higher and higher and higher. But our pool of med techs has gotten smaller and smaller. And not just that, the micro med techs that actually want to do peristology have become fewer and fewer. So a few years ago, um, my group published a study in JCM using uh, uh, a, a more semi-automated way of processing stool for ONP. And that was a great win for our lab, but it really only helped the technicians. It didn't help the technologists who had to read the specimens. So when we first got into this, this idea of, um, can we use this in peristology? We discussed, you know, what would this look like? What would actually be beneficial? And we decided that a screen out test basically a way to make all those negatives that we have to go through quickly evaluated and pushed off the review queue with confidence is what we really wanted. So if we could teach them an artificial intelligence model to be really sensitive at the expense of specificity. So show a few images that aren't real, but that doesn't matter because we have the expertise to, to look at that and say, that's schmutz, we're fine and then move on. But we didn't want to risk missing anything. So show me more, I can decide what you're showing me. Obviously there's a balance there because it has to be efficient still. Um, and the, the, back, the fact of the matter is, my technologists have fun looking at positives, but they hate the negatives. And if the negatives are 96 to 98%, that's a lot of negative you know, feeling of work to be doing. Yeah. So, so to make sure I've got it right, the idea was basically to reduce the workload on the on the technologists by reducing the number of slides they needed to look at. You wanted to robustly screen out negatives, capture all the positives, even if you captured a few negatives along with that positives, those positives, it would be okay. Is that right? The idea? Gotcha. In fact, originally we were aiming for seventy percent of the negatives to be able to be clearly uh, screened out. So we were, we were actually, the bar was pretty low. We said, even if we have to look at 30% of them still, that's an advantage. Um, and not to give away the punchline, but we ended up getting a lot better than that. 
Got it. Good. Well, we'll come to that soon. That's good. Before we come to that, though, um, I think a lot of us in clinical microbiology and pathology generally, and sort of our affiliated fields, infectious diseases, pharm uh, pharmacy, and so on, do, don't have any kind of deep understanding or even uh, mediocre understanding of what artificial intelligence is and how it can be applied. So can you tell us a little bit about what artificial intelligence means and how the system that you used in your study actually works? Sure. Um, and I'll be honest, when I first um, was introduced to this by uh, colleagues here, one that's now at uh, Mayo, um, the world works with Bobby, um, when he first introduced it here, I had no idea what any of it meant. Artificial intelligence to me was a Hollywood movie. So, uh, you know, the most basic definition is, and, and this, the artificial intelligence people would kill me if they heard me defining stuff this way, but to really make it digestible, it's just basically using a machine to solve a problem that someone defines. So you have a problem, you define it, and then you let a machine try to solve it. Um, in the microbiology community, often we talk about machine learning as our prototypical AI. But really, machine learning is just a, a concept within the global scale of AI. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a colleague about you know, intelligence artificial intelligence, and really machine learning isn't intelligent. Nothing it does is intelligent. Um, it just learns through repetition and experiences. So I try to use the analogy when I talk about this to micro people, think about it like a dog. You have to train a dog. A dog is not intelligent. I'm a cat person, so I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs aren't intelligent, but they are very, very good at learning patterns. Whereas you can't train a cat because they're so smart. They don't want to know. <laughs> so you have your dog and you're going to give it an experience. And that experience, it's going to learn from. So there's two different ways you can do machine learning. You can do unsupervised learning, which is basically you take a lot of data, show it to a machine learning model and say, go ahead and try to do something. Um, or you can do supervised learning, which is when you take data that you've already annotated and you already tell the model, this is X, this is Y, this is Z. Go in with all this extra data we're going to plug in and show me every X, Y, and Z you can find. So, so to make it concrete with your study, you had to have images of specific gastrointestinal parasites that you then fed into the system and said, this is this one and this is that one and so on. Is that right? Right. So we actually started with an unsupervised approach because the machine learning guys we, we collaborated with were adamant that, you know, we can do this, it'll work. It was a train wreck. It took so much remediation of the, of the model that it was quicker to actually have um, the expert, which is Blaine Atheson, who did all the, the legwork for this data, go in and just draw boxes around everything that was real and start by teaching the model, this is good, this is bad. How, how, uh, many, how many examples did Blaine have to provide to the model? <laughs> um, I think the biggest one was, that we did was blastocystis, just because that one was tricky because it can be you know, varying sizes and colors and distribution of nuclei. I think he taught it over 60,000 individuals. <laughs> <laughs> That's unreal. <laughs> yeah, um, so doing it that way though, you know, you didn't do them all at once. What happens is you start with kind of a ground truth of, of true positive examples, and then the model runs in the background overnight and tries to take a stab at predicting more. And then Blaine would go in the next day and say, yeah, you, you got these ones, but these are total garbage. And then it's basically like, it's like, you know, tapping your dog on the nose and saying no, down, versus giving it a bone and saying, yes, good job. So when we, when Blaine would confirm the the organism, that was positive reinforcement to the model. And when he would say, no, that's wrong and remove it from the set, that was guiding the model to say, you got that wrong, don't do that again. I'm beginning to feel sympathy for the model. Uh, I already felt sympathy for Blaine, but now I'm feeling sympathy for the model because I am a dog person. Uh, all right, so you told us a little bit about how you set the system up. Um, how did you evaluate it once you had it actually put into place, ready to go? So that was probably the most laborious process with getting to the to the evaluation stage. So as I said, a lot of that was just the the feeding in the data, but we also learned that we had to give it a really big variety of data. And that included, you know, showing it not just textbook examples, but actually giving it a lot of bad examples, 
what do things look like when they're not fixed well? What do things look like when the stool isn't inoculated in the right ratio to fix it? If what what does E. coli and Tamiba coli do with different trichrome stains? Which, which sometimes e. and Tamiba coli. And to me, but good, thank you. Sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's purple. Well, the AI needs to actually see all those to reliably detect them every time. So you can't just show it all the pink ones or it may not want to identify the blue and purple. So we did that to get to the point where the, the model was robust for the major categories we had to detect. And that was basically monitored in real time. So Blaine would constantly monitor it, our AI colleagues would review and there'd be you know, graphs showing rock curves and precision recall curves. And as we added data, sometimes it would actually make things worse. So then you'd have to remove certain data sets because you might add to Giardia and the Giardia was already at a high performing level and all of a sudden your defrag starts going down. So we'd monitor that in real time. And we got to a point where essentially in the development phase, once we added more and more data and we just didn't see any appreciable performance on the individual organisms, we said, okay, this is probably as good as we're gonna get with this current iteration of the model. And so then we locked it down and brought it into the R&D validation environment. So so just before you go on to the validation piece of it, um, or excuse me, the, the clinical validation of it, it sounds like a human would look at uh, pink E. coli uh, over and over and over. And then when they, I think most people, when they saw a purple one would think, oh, that's the same thing, but it's purple. But the computer doesn't have that ability. It has to see an example of every permutation of what that might look like. It, to be the most sensitive, yes. I mean, it could, so, uh, you know, when we conceive pattern recognition, we think that's E. coli, I'm looking at E. coli. The machine learning doesn't actually recognize the entire organism. It, it recognizes, pixel layered um, textures that the human eye doesn't appreciate. Mm. So for instance, for the entamoeba, we didn't actually teach it the entire organism. We taught it what the nucleus looks like. So it actually doesn't see the entire organism. It sees the structure of the nucleus with a background texture, which might be different colors, might be different densities, but that's actually what it's, what it's looking at. That's and it's not, it's not recognizing the entire nucleus, even though that's what we've told it to recognize it's detecting aspects of pixelation that we can't conceive. <laughs> that is absolutely fascinating. Um, all right, so I think we've got as good an understanding as we're going to have about the artificial intelligence piece of it um, and how you actually set it up. So can you tell us about the clinical validation of it? How did you test it out to see how well it would work on, on clinical specimens once you had your system pretty much ready to go? We wanted to make sure, basically, that whatever we brought into clinical validation to bring to the lab, it had to be, it had to be as good or better than what we did with, did with a human, because there was no point in taking a step backward just to gain efficiency. That's just not going to work. So we gathered, and, and thankfully, Blaine and myself tend to be hoarders when it comes to parasite specimens. So we had a really good library of slides that we'd been saving for several years, and good examples of lots of different organisms. And so we basically took a, a large slide set of positives and, and negatives. And that, that was basically representative of all the different organism classes that we wanted to be able to, to validate and scan them into our scanner system and put them through the AI. So we ended up um, having a total of 87 unique positive slides that we fed through and 86 of them, the model was able to correctly detect. Uh, in fact, the one that it failed to uh, was an uh, endolimix nana specimen that had very few on the slide. And in hindsight, when Blaine looked at his notes, when he evaluated the images, he wrote in his notebook, e nana question mark, but in the end, thought the images didn't look good enough to have prompted a slide review. But when he reviewed the slide, it was actually in Anna. So we counted it as a miss, but it really did detect that it just, you couldn't make a clear identification from the pictures. Mm -hmm. um, it, sorry. It, it's all right. No, was Blaine's read the, the reference or gold standard, or did you compare it to technologists, compare your system to technologists who were unaware of what the, what the slides contained? 
So all the slides previously had been identified by our existing technologists in the lab. So these would not have been identified by Blaine per se. They'd have been just a smattering of whoever happened to be in the laboratory. Got it. So the routine, then, lab, the routine lab reading was the, the reference standard? Correct. Um, for the negative specimens, there was two that we considered false positives, and we had, I think, 130 negatives. Um, and those two false positives, basically, Blaine felt like the images were convincing enough that he had to pull a slide in order to find out that they were actually false positive. So um, this, that specificity was actually higher than we were expecting. That's much higher than the the seventy percent that you you set yeah. as your goal. Yeah. yeah. And then another interesting thing is, you know, we 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 evaluated this by slide level accuracy. So, detected parasite or not, we didn't look at it necessarily on which parasites were detected. Um, but when we actually looked at it that way, there were several instances where protozoa that hadn't been initially detected by a human were actually flagged by the software. And when Blaine back read it, he found them. That's interesting. That, that that actually brings me to something that surprised me in the paper, and that is that um, when you did your limited detection study to see how few parasites the system could detect, um, the system was more sensitive than the technologists, if I understood correctly, um, it, meaning it, it could detect fewer parasites per slide. Um, despite that, the two systems, the systems, the system and the technologists had similar performance with the real specimen. So, You've touched on how, one ramification of that difference. Have there been other things that have come out of that um, as you continue to use the system? That difference in analytical sensitivity? Yeah, I think what it really comes down to when, in, when a slide has ample organisms on it, um, the human and the AI are gonna both detect them without much effort. And I think because our validation set were largely specimens that technologists themselves had found then these rare, rare parasite burden ones were not represented in our validation accuracy set. When we did the LOD study, it would be more mimicking something that was extremely rare, very few, that a technologist reviewing a slide for five minutes is probably gonna miss. And when we actually deployed this in real life, we've seen a few instances, I think three at this point, where the AI detected one or two beautiful textbook image quality Giardia trophs that were not reported um, or, or would not have been reported by a human. And yep. we know that because when they pull the slide to verify it, <laughs> they can't find it. Um, <laughs> so they looked at it for 30 minutes in some cases where they finally found it and go, oh, there it is. And often what they had to do was look at the scan of the actual topography of the, the slide and try to find that spot on the slide and home in on it and go, oh, there it is. Well, in a real practice, you're not gonna catch that. But yep. the software just draws you right to it and says, here it is, tell me what you think. It reminds me of a, of a classic and parental problem in clinical microbiology and validation of our tests. If we have a new test that's better than the gold standard, there's, it makes it very difficult to evaluate the new test. It's like when uh, PCR was first coming into clinical use and people were looking at it for a detection of chlamydia trachomatis um, to detect STIs. Um, PCR was clearly better than the older methods of detection, but the statistics just became a mess. And that is a subject for another day. Um, I, could, I could, as you both know, I could talk about that for uh, far too long. Um, so Mark, are you, are you using the system now routinely as part of your clinical testing, right? What, what have you learned since implementing it? Yeah, so we went live August 2019. So we're, we're almost a year and we're about a year now in. Um, you know, the example of the rare positives, um, that that's obviously the first lesson that these low burden positives can be detected and then force a thorough in, in investigation to find them. So I think that's better patient care because we're not going to let those slip through. Um, I think it actually adds more confidence and improves the review process for the technologists because they've got that extra piece to look at and to, to prompt them to say, oh, you know, I looked, you know, they may look at a slide in convention practice and say, I found this and this, but if there's some images saying this might be in there, it might give them that extra step to go, well, let me look a little bit harder. Um, the mm -hmm. other thing is the negative review. It's the, when we see negatives, it actually looks better than even in validation. There are very few false images shown to the user and they're usually very obviously false. So, you know, if there's a case where they're not sure, they can still pull the slide to review it thoroughly, but uh, often there's just very little to be shown and, and 
they've the staff has become very comfortable um, doing that type of uh, evaluation of the images and feeling confident that they're not missing anything. Do you have an estimate in terms of the, do you have an estimate of how many person hours you have reduced or how much you've increased the efficiency of the labor? So we have some, some preliminary data on that, but um, so if we look at the total turnaround time of the O&P, the limiting factor is still the wet mount. Now we're doing R&D on that as our next, one of our next projects, but um, the wet mount is, you know, until you have that result, you can't release anything. Yeah. So we saw the trichromes getting pushed through. Um, in some cases, you know, people are able to do three trichrome runs in a morning where previously they'd have done one, um, but those wet mounts are still <laughs> lagging the process. So potentially a 66-ish percent reduction if we just use a very ballpark uh, we'd like to document that a little more. The challenge with that, though, honestly, Alex, is no one wants to go back to doing it manually. <laughs> um, in fact, when our scanner was down for service for like 48 hours, uh, my most experienced technologist, who's got 30 some odd years in peristology, said, he goes, Chase, he goes, Mark, I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> well, I can, I can understand. I can understand, um, having spent too much time looking at parasites myself. Um, all right, Bobby and Mark, we have some time left. Um, and so I thought we might play a little game I made up. And this is a game called species or bull feces. And here's how it will work. <laughs> I will name a genus and species, and it might be real, it might be a real microorganism, or it might be something I've made up. And you'll each say whether you think it's a real species or just bull feces. And to keep me from picking anything too obscure, the real names appear somewhere in standard reference Manual of Clinical Microbiology, which is now part of uh, ClinMicro Now, available online. Uh, you will each get one point for a correct answer, and the awesome, the winner gets awesome bragging rights. So here is our first one. And Bobby, why don't you take the first guess on this one, and then we'll go to Mark for this one. So our first one is Exerohylum longrostratum. Do you think that's species. a species? Species? I think so. She sounds confident. What do you think, Mark? I agree. All right, you're both right. Uh, did Yay. you know it? Well, I knew the genus was right. The genus. <laughs> yeah, no. the, gen the genus is one. The genus is one that we heard a lot about because uh, E. rostratum was the cause of that 2012 outbreak of fung fungal, fungal meningitis due to the contaminated methylprednisolone. Um, but this is a melanized fungus that's characterized by long distoceptate canidia with a distinct protruding basal hilum. Mycology is not my thing. Um, <laughs> this is an opportunistic pathogen of humans and other vertebrates. It can cause sinusitis, keratitis, peritonitis, uh, endocarditis, and other deep-seated fungal infections. Very good. All right. I'm, gonna so always, I'm just going to always agree with the fungus because their taxonomy is all over the place anyway. Yeah, true. Good point. <laughs> all right. So here's our second one. And Mark, you'll go first on this one. Exogortha lobotii. I'm going to go with bull feces. Hmm. Over to you, Bobby. What do you think? I don't know, Alex. You're so good at making up names. <laughs> Anyone that's read your comic strip. Uh, I also think bull feces. Ah, well, you guys are killing it. You're both right. <laughs> oh, so right. I, I was struggling to figure out how to come up with fake names this morning. And so these are both from uh, things in The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> The genus Exogortha is from Exogorth, which was the giant space slug on the asteroid that the Millennium Falcon yeah. flew into and then flew out of. And I found these on a website of obscure characters from the, this, these movies. Um, and then Lobotii is from the head of Lando Calrissian's security force, whose name was Lobot. All right. So it's a tie. If you guys pick the same answer every time, you're going to tie. Our next <laughs> one is, uh, Bobby, you're first. Okay. Alice. Alice Stipes under donkey eye. Hmm. Could be real, but I guess I'm going to say bull feces. I know that genus is, a, is real, so I'm going to go with, with species. Mark has got this one. All right. Oh, Bobby, was it because of the species name under donkey eye? Yeah, it sounded yeah. like, I don't know, something kind of fun that you made up. Yeah, so it is named for Andy Onderdonk. Onderdonk. 
Yes. Uh, okay. Andy was, of course, uh, until very recently, he just retired, but he was the director of clinical microbiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Andy was the editor in chief of JCM from 1999 to 2009. Mm -hmm. He then took a year off and came, became uh, one of the editors of JCM and has just finished that. So he has uh, been helping out at JCM for 20 years. Wow. This is a gram negative anaerobic non spore forming bacillus. It's found in the microbiota of the gastrointestinal tract. And it has been rarely associated, as you might expect, with abdominal abscesses and appendicitis. Very good. And we have our last one. So we've got Bobby to Mark three, slightly. This is our last one. And I guess this is for all the chips. This is seal pox virus, S-E-A-L, seal pox virus. And I think, who's going first on this one? Oh, God. I think it's supposed to be me. All right. My wife's going to kill me. She's a pox virologist. Oh, no. Um, gosh, I know every vertebrate and invertebrate has its own specific pox virus. I just don't know if it would be called seal pox or pinniped pox. Uh, I'm going to go with species. All right. Species. Yeah, I would say species as well. You are both correct. It is a species. Oh. This is a pox virus that can cause firm skin, nodule, skin nodules of seals and sea lions. Um, the lesions become inflamed or necrotic. They usually heal spontaneously, leaving a scar. It has caused human infections in animal handlers who have been bitten by a seal or sea lion um, or who had breaks in the skin and had contact with one of the lesions on one of the seals. Um, in humans, it causes sort of a typical uh, zoonotic pox virus infection where you get nodules, which can progress to ulceration, but they typically resolve spontaneously. So Bob, I think, uh, Mark, you are the champion. Congratulations. Nice job, Mark. Thanks. Fine work. Um, <laughs> thank you both. This has been a lot of fun and a great conversation. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Mark. Or sorry. <laughs> thank you, Alex. <laughs> okay. and thank you, Mark, as well. Appreciate you joining us, too. Thanks, Alex.